Father, we come up for you right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. God, we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your power, your might. We thank you for your ability, Lord God, to bring us through the worst times, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for even now, for what you're taking us through now, God. We ask for your presence to be here, Lord God. I ask God that you lead in God. Order our steps. Lord, your word declares that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So, God, we ask that you order our steps, Lord God, lead and guide us through this process, Lord God. And let you get the glory in it, Lord God. Let the name of Jesus be reflected in everything that we do, God, for we are grateful, God, for the opportunity. We are grateful, Lord God, to even be here right now. So, God, we give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, um, my name is Thomas Jordan. Uh, 48 years old, I'll be 49 in November at the time of this. So, uh, November the night, I'll be 49. Thank God to reach 49. I remember there was a time when I was told that I wouldn't reach the age of 18. I either, I either be dead in the streets or I would be in prison. I come to learn that. Uh, the word of God is true. I believe it's in Proverbs 18 and 21. It declares that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love and eat it thereof. So what that means is people will tell you stuff, and you keep hearing stuff. Sooner or later, you'll begin to believe it. And then that belief will become your reality. And so I believe that I wasn't going to amount too much. I believe that I was subjected to a certain way of life, I believe that I had to be uh, what other folk thought I had to be. And when it was spoken in my life that I would end up either dead or in prison for the rest of my life, um, I didn't die, but I was sentenced to life. <laughs> Funny as it is, at the age of 18, I received a natural life sentence in the Florida prison system, and the life sentence is just that. In the Florida prison system, you know, I should have died, amen, in the prison system. But God had mercy on me, He showed me grace, and so now I'm sitting here now. And I think we have to realize that we have the ability um, to shape our reality according to the Word of God because death and life is in the power of your tongue. If you say something long enough and you believe it, you take part of it. And we, we read scripture and a lot of times we don't understand. The Bible says, so a man thinketh, so is he. And so if somebody's always telling me that I'm not gonna amount to nothing, somebody's always telling me that I'm gonna be a criminal, in my mind and my heart, that's who I am. And so now I gotta find a way to be the best criminal, the best no good joker that anybody thought that I would be. And so I find myself living up to other people's expectation of what my life should be. So it wasn't until I actually turned uh, 18, I just got out of prison uh, for selling heroin. Excuse me. I just got out of prison for selling heroin. Um, went to prison at the age of 17 for selling heroin. And um, I was just released. And on my November the 8th, my birthday is November the 9th, I was released on November the 8th, and uh, I got a call from a family member or two, and they had some issues going on, um, my background was selling drugs and robbery, they had an issue going on where they had given somebody some drugs, and in the process of giving them drugs, you know, somehow things ain't go the way it's supposed to have went, and I got a call, and it was asked to me, like, hey man, you want to ride with us, you know, X, Y, and Z happened and me being the way I was at the time and the way I thought at the time, I was like, well, if it was mine, I'd go get mine, you know what I'm saying? Wouldn't be, I mean, just being honest, wouldn't be no question about it, you know, I would go get my money. And so um, they came and picked me up and I had a thought, it's, it's crazy. I had a thought, I was in the back seat, they was in the front seat, and they put both guns in my hand, it was a, it was a 38 revolver, and a Mac 11, and now I'm thinking to myself, now if I take these guns, they can't do nothing to me. They ain't gonna do nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? I can tell you, tell them to go ahead on. Literally, that was my thought. And I didn't follow through with my thought. I looked at them, I gave them back to them, and 
the 38 revolver was given back to me. And once we got to the scene of the crime, got to where we were going, it was it was a carnival in Jacksonville. This public record, you can look at it, you can go and find it. Um, it, it was public record. And so we got to the carnival, and I was given a 38 revolver. And I thank God because on that day, uh, things really got ugly. But all grace to God, I was given a gun that only had one bullet in it. <laughs> so I, I can laugh now when I look back, but I see that it makes me know that God had a plan for my life. You know, doing the reflective part, looking back, and I see that God really had a plan for my life. And so a lot of things that I've been through, it really helped me see. I feel like crying, man, but it really helped me see what the Bible says that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord that are called according to His purpose. And that worked out for my good because in the process of catching five counts of attempted murder, and one count of armed robbery and all this stuff, in the process of going to trial and going down there, I began to, I had nowhere else to turn to. The only person I could turn to only, only thing that I could I could really find peace and solace in was the Bible. And then I got to a place to where I was knowing the Bible and that became how God began to teach and recreate me. Um, it's through the Bible. So in my process of going there, I just, I, I found myself Family was family. They didn't fight each other over everything. Right. Man, it's hard to get your family to come out of a, a prayer bar, to come out of family reunion. You know what I'm saying? When well, you can spend time and kind of enjoy each other. Right. Um, I'm just trying to get the way I can. It's not where it was when I was selling drugs, but most of it's still the same. Most of these houses that that you see, they was here. Um, well, how, how, how young? Were you? Yeah. That one with the Macy's. Yeah. So how 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 young were you when you started selling drugs? I was 15 years old when I started selling drugs. Uh, got a girl pregnant, and you know she had a miscarriage. My mind ain't never think that, listen, you ain't got to sell drugs no more. You know, you, once you got a made up mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. you realize that, wait a minute, I ain't got to do this. That'll help a lot of us when we make bad decisions and now we got our minds, so, okay, I'm going to go do this. And then we realize, hey, you ain't got to do this no more. The situation don't dictate that you got to be that person or that you got to do this anymore. So you ain't got nothing left? What that? Girl, drug? Yeah. Not the first piece. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're looking for it, you might go. Find some one of you two out of this house over here. So what what caused big drug house? What caused you to do it? I mean what, what made you say, okay. Um, I got a girl pregnant. Oh, okay. I got a girl pregnant and I wanted to be better than my father. My dad wasn't there for me. Got so it. I wanted to be able to provide for my kids. As crazy as it may sound, but that's the reason why I started selling drugs. I didn't want my kids to be without, like I was without. Look, uh, how you doing today, y'all? Yeah. All right, how y'all doing? All right. Yeah. So, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. How long you been living here? About 20 years. About 20, you remember when them shotgun houses was right here? No, I didn't. Oh, you came out today, I don't took them down. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this area right here. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's right, that's been over there. That's been out. Did 21 of the 19. All this area right here, 
They used to be shotgun houses. This is where I used to sit, bro. Call them shotgun houses or, or whatever. It used to be like, I can't describe what a shotgun, the only thing that's still here, that, that's here, that, them apartments. That was here. They used to sell reef out of that. I sold drawers right here in this field. It used to be like four, five, six shotgun houses. Mm -hmm. We used to call it Vietnam. Those houses over there wasn't there. They wasn't there. It was wood and trees. And we used to sell dope right along here. Man, this street, you look at it now, it ain't nothing like it used to be like. And it's a football field. Man, we used to have this thing, but they need to turn it into a football yeah. field. Now, this would be a bad thing to, to, to well, buy and, and to do right. something that's positive what, that's for what the we do. Have fields like this. We don't sign any house at the park or wherever we're going, and we'll play football. Yeah. So we can the kids the house out. house behind us, because we right over there, the church right over there. Yeah. The house right used to be a path in one of these. What are these? Yeah, I think this white one right here. We used to have a little path we used to walk through. That used to be the um, moon side. We used to go over there and get our moon side. Uh, but this field right here, man, is where I did. I saw this is where I was T at. That's where they know me from T. I had all the best reef in Jacksonville. They were like, that's what I'm just telling the truth. Um, selling drugs and stuff right here in this field. Those shotgun houses. I, I got my first carrying a concealed weapon right here. Um, I had a gun, I threw the drugs and the police ran down on me. And I was halfway under the house. I'm like, don't shoot, don't shoot. But back then, I think it was Lady Blue and Nelson. Those were the police. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those type mm -hmm. names, but mm -hmm. they, they, if you had a gun, you know, they was gonna shoot you out. Know, they had my hand way up on the house. I said, y'all gonna have to pull me out. I got a gun, I'm not gonna right. put I'm my not note. We pulled me out, I caught my first concealed weapon because I hadn't got rid of the drugs. But this is where I did most of my hustle at. Right here. Other sides of town, but this is where it really started at for me. And it started right here for me. Yeah. And on the next street over, <laughs> we got a church. You know what I'm saying? God uh, used us to come past the church on this side. Um, but like I said, a lot of folks that, you know, if we walk around this way, there's a song I can show you all. I can't remember who's saying it. I want to sing Canton Spirit. They say you got to clean up. What you done messed with? What you messed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Started my life, life all, all over. over again. And sometimes we you got them brought them back full circle. They start hustling, selling drugs on this block. And uh -huh. over on the next street over, got them brought them back full circle. Now he's the pastor trying to clean up the same neighborhood. And that don't work for everybody. Some people don't make it, don't live long enough to, to make a change or see a change. But he yep. did. Maybe that's the pathway. Is that it? Yeah. That pathway right there? Yeah. Is that it? We're gonna make it there. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna make it there. Yeah, uh, this is Growing up, I was the oldest of four boys. And I had one sister that was older than all four of us. Um, it was Alicia, Thomas, Vincent, Ernest, and Bernard. Uh, my mom had five kids. I like to talk about, I talk about her because my mom kind of showed me, I just got to keep it truthful, you know what I'm saying? Because she showed me what a, a strong woman should be. I remember, <clears throat> I can very, I honestly, I want to get said the right way. I don't remember my mama really needing assistance the way that these people are having assist, you know, assistance from the government, uh, wicking all that stuff. Um, she raised five kids. I remember seeing my mom working two jobs. I remember seeing my mom laying concrete, coming home with the concrete boots and all this stuff, doing what she needed to do to take care of her five kids. So she, she kind of gave me an idea that a mother gonna do whatever it takes for her kids, you um, know. I gotta say, my dad, um, his name is Thomas Smith. My mom's name is, her maiden name is Gloria Jean Jordan. I believe that's where I get my middle name from, Thomas Eugene um, Jordan. But <clears throat> my 
my uh, first name come from my dad. His name is Thomas Smith. Uh, but my mom, Gloria, um, she, she, she did what it takes to take care of five kids. And she was a fighter. She would drink as well, you know what I'm saying? But then it came a time she got to know the Lord. But she raised us, man, to where we knew it was about us. And like I said, uh, out of the four boys, she made me go to church. Um, I was always in church. I was doing Boy Scout stuff. Let me tell you, but the thing about me was, <laughs> I wasn't taking no whoopings. <laughs> My mom would get ready to whoop me, man, and I would, I would always run away, man. I, I'm gonna tell you the one story I remember. I always run away. I run away. See, I knew what I if I knew my mom was gonna beat me, I was not gonna be home. When she got home, or when she told me she was gonna beat me, you know how some of the mom tell you go in the room and get the belt. Man, I got beat with everything. She ain't say go get the belt. She might tell you go get a stitch cord. I don't know. Yeah, man, but I'm finna tell you the story. But if I knew my mama was gonna beat me, and she would tell me to go get something, okay, I go get it. She probably was still looking for me to take. <laughs> I would run away, like literally, man, I would run away, you know, you're not gonna beat me. And so, <laughs> so one day, man, I called myself, I would run away and go to my grandma's house, cause I knew if I got to Francis' house, one day, nothing gonna happen to me. I don't care who it is. You ain't gonna beat her grandbaby. And this was so crazy, I think grandma had, did she have 18 grand? Or, uh, 21 grand or something like that. That is great grand, but you weren't gonna be her churn. And so, one time I ran away. This is the time to stop me from running away, really. Um, I don't need, I can't, I'm not gonna lie, try to tell you what it was about. I knew I ran away. And my mom's sister, uh, Viola, man, she found out that my mama called her and told her, don't let Tomo get the mama house. <laughs> so, so she had my cousin, uh, Jock and Richard. They, 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 those were my first two big brothers. Uh, Jock and Richard, uh, they had them, they out there looking for them. Man, listen, this is the truth. I'm watching them looking for me. I'm all on top of houses. <laughs> listen, I, I'm, I'm there and I don't climb up a tree and got on the roof because I know they looking for me. And I know they ain't gonna be thinking about looking for me on no roof. I don't know what made Richard look up there and tell, hey, go up there. <laughs> He's trying to come down and jump. I'm trying to run from one side. He running that side. And one of them trying to come up there and the other one trying to stay down. So when I jump, when I finally jump, he got me. Man, that lady beat me so bad, I got wet for right now, still on me. Man, you damn right. Right then my auntie beat me so bad, I ain't ran away again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you got to lie. I got the wealth to prove it. I got the wealth to prove it. Man, I got wealth so I let it beat me with that stitching cord. But I ain't ran away since, man. But I love my mama. Man, her and my mama got in a fight out there. Like, you don't beat my child. <laughs> but you the one told him to go get it. You know? right. but, but I love them all, man. Follow them, man. Um, auntie, man, she was real. You know what I'm saying? She is real. She's still alive today. Um, she is real, man. Um, I love them all, man. But you know, my childhood is one where I always, I always was a do it. You know what I'm saying? I, I would go play football. We, children of day ain't nothing like when we, um, when we are uh, was growing up. They don't do nothing. Yet. I, I guess I'm like them. They don't. They don't affected me. I'm on the PS4 when I ain't studying my Bible. <laughs> I can't talk about it. They got me where I'm on the PS4 when I'm not in my Bible and stuff or not talking to my wife, I guess. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the things that we did. A lot of them. I remember I used to always end up somehow or another. I was always going to get stitches. I mean, my stitches in here. My sister, I don't know if you can see it, but cut right across there. My sister had me getting stitches right there. This finger right here was cut all the way around. I had to almost, yeah, from here to there a long time ago, man. So I always was doing something and I always, you know what I'm saying? I just figured the devil was trying to kill me when I was young. Um, I had um, one of my mom's friends. I don't know if Cynthia was her daughter or 
think she was a niece or something. Um, um, when I was used to babysit us, man, and as a little boy, you know, I had me doing things that I ain't had no business doing. So I've really been through a lot of stuff, um, truthfully. And so most men don't talk about being molested because I mean, we, we don't look at it as molested. We look at it as it's a natural thing that's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen, but not at that age. You know what I'm saying? Somebody shouldn't be exposing. You really don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? And it affected um, a lot of stuff that we do. You know what I'm saying? So, and so most men, uh, when they leave, somebody, you man, how you been molested? That's what people put. Not at that age. And I was, we were staying in Brentwood, and I, I probably was 12. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I really know what to do. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. Um, I had uh, another guy, uh, my mom had some uh, gay guys, I guess it was. He, he, he gonna try to get me one day. I had to run out of the house on that, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I never told her because, you know, how you tell your mom, these these her friends. This, this is stuff people don't deal with, you know what I'm saying? But I thank God, you know, I'm not gay. Um, I love women, um, don't think about me. Even in prison, it wasn't an issue. You know, I didn't desire a man, didn't, but never with a man. I just knew that was wrong, and I just think that I'm bringing it up because there's a lot of stuff people won't really talk about. Just like I told you, you know, for me, that nothing is off issue. I mean, off limit. You know, I, I'm, I, we can talk about whatever because I, I'm, I'm solid in who I am. I'm confident in who God is making me to be and where He is taking me. And so there's nothing I'm ashamed of, but I think it's best that we. You know, if I'm really gonna help somebody, some people, some areas, some men that got raped, some men that have been there don't know how to handle it, and they don't know how to deal with other men. There's some men that I, you know, just think we. The problem with us, is, in my opinion, sometimes as men we can be insensitive. Mm -hmm. A generation have taught us. I don't know how I got away with it. This is a deep subject. To talk about my childhood. We can. <laughs> we can. We can be insensitive to things because we've been taught that. We can't be emotional, we're supposed to be tough and this is the way things is and if it don't kill us, it'll make us better. But what about the long term psychological damage that is done? Even with me going to prison for 21 years, first marriage was destined to fail. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I didn't know nothing about it. All I just knew, hey man, I want a wife. I knew I was going to come out here and preach. I knew I needed a wife. And so I got with a woman, and you know, it's a woman never took the time to know her, never took the time to learn how to talk to her and to respond to her. Probably never, they, you know, you just jump on, do what you do, and, and then lay down, go to sleep, and hey, honey, love you, go to work. You never learn those things. You have to, to be have a, a good, healthy relationship. You gotta go into it. You gotta see it. Um, I think what I'm gonna have, Amen. I, I, I added in my spirit to do a men's conference about dealing with every issue of a man. And let, you know, it's all right sometimes to cry. And I think that's probably why I got here from my childhood. A lot of stuff I never had time to really cry about. A lot of stuff I couldn't take with my mom. Well, my boy, man, I told you when I was young, running from two brothers. No, you better go fight. You gonna be a man. And that's how we raise our kids. We're not trying to raise our sons to like men or to walk or act like women, but it's okay to express your emotions. It took me up until all these years to know it's all right to cry. It's all right to tell another man you love him, not fear gay. And, and tell him and mean it. But as a child, you know, I, my brothers, man, I think I had the best brothers. I guess the reason why I really can't talk about them a lot because I wasn't never there. You know what I'm saying? I was always running away from home. Um, when we did, me and my sister stayed with my grandma for a good little period because my mother had five kids. And then, that's not an excuse, but I wasn't really there. When I was in high school, they was just coming along. And they say, you know, I'm selling drugs. I'm in the streets at, at 16, 15, 16. I'm in the streets. You know what I'm saying? Doing selling drugs and all this shit. So I never really had a chance to really connect. And so I really don't fault my brothers now when they don't look at me as their big brother. You know what I'm saying? Because I was not there. You know what I'm saying? I end up 
17 going to prison. So my other cousins and all them, so I see why, you know, they look up to them and be like, yo, hey man, uh, or when they having a drink and I try to like, bro, let me drive you home. And I can't, they don't respond to me like they respond to them because I wasn't there. Everything that we do in life is based on relationships. If you never right that to be present, you can't. The one, only one that I had a great relationship with is my sister, man, because it's always been me and her. We always, even now, it's me and her. And it just, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, I love my brothers, and I really can't talk about no childhood with my brothers because most of the time I was in, I was in trouble in prison or the teacher center for stealing cars and stuff like that. But, so now I understand when they looked at my cousins them who was always there for them, complaining about what they were doing, they just needed somebody to guide them and they big brother went there. But either way it is, I can't really talk about no childhood with my brothers because I didn't have them. You know what I'm saying? I got four brothers after the age of eight, you know what I'm saying? I remember when we stayed on Roll Island Drive. We, <laughs> we stayed on Roll Island Drive. We used to go back there and fish in the Reebok River and stuff. We used to do stuff. Just one time, I think, I, I definitely remember we were staying on Roll Island Drive. And me and my brothers, we would walk from. We had an auntie that stayed on Cleveland Road. So Road Island Drive, Washington, Lincoln Estate, and Cleveland Road, you go up the Mar Creek and you turn. We will walk from there and go to my Auntie Charlotte house. She's in um, a sister living facility. Auntie Charlotte was the best. Um, she loved everybody. She was good people. Um, and we would walk along the ditch. <laughs> Me and all my brothers and stuff, we going over Auntie house and we going along the ditch. And my brother, Ernest, we walking. It's for us. We just walking. And we look down the ground moving. Man, we walking in a bed of water moccasins. You know what I'm saying? So we running, man, we crying and oh Lord, but glory to God, like literally if we was walking, it had to at least be about 50, 60 snakes right. Oh my goodness. And we walking on it. You know what I'm saying? In the ditch. We ain't know. Right. You know, we gotta thank God that no snake ain't bite us or nothing like that. We running like, oh Lord, cry, looking crazy, but that's the only thing I can really remember, you know, about my brothers, man, and as far as us being kids and my sister. I remember my sister one time, um, I think my sister had a, I don't know if she had got pregnant. I think she had got pregnant with, with her first child, Josh. And my mom, let me see, I can get this right. No, she got caught stealing. My sister got caught stealing with some girls out of, um, I think it was J.C. Penney's or something. At the time in Jacksonville, it was in Gateway. She got caught stealing, and so she came home, and my mama was whooping me. I told my mama, you ain't gonna hit my sister no more. And my mama looked at me and her, so I tell you what, you right. Both of y'all get out of my house. <laughs> she kicked both of us out. I'm like, where we gonna go? You can't kick us out. I know you grown enough to tell me what I ain't gonna do. You gonna get out of my house. And um, you know, me and my sister always been close, man. I, like, for real. We had one spell where I think the only time that we, we had a falling out is my mom. I just got my mom in prison. I'm just getting released out of prison. Um, and it's so crazy, man. I was doing 21 years, and I'm here, and all this. My sister don't move the way she's in Maryland, and um, I'm here, and my mama telling me that my sister taking all the money and all this stuff here, and so you know, you who you gonna believe? Again, it go by the relationship and the influence that you have on people, but you really have to be prayed up, and you really have to have the guidance of God to be able to help you deal with people, because. So I'm like, man, you up there taking my mama money and all this stuff here and all this. And my sister, she mad. We going up on each other. I'm like, man, don't even, don't even talk to me, man. You ain't right, man. You doing your mama like this here, man. And it wasn't until she came to stay with me that I experienced the same thing. <laughs> she telling my sister, man, my mama told my sister, man. And this is this is so crazy. This was in my first marriage. Um, we stand on Atlantic Boulevard. My mama came to stay with me. And, um, 
I told my mom, you know, we were going to the church for us. We had a church event. You know, I'm a minister in the church, so I got to go there and make sure everything's set up. And so I'm telling my mom, listen, ride with Julian. I don't want to ride with her. I said, listen, mom, I got to go. You going to ride with her or you ain't going to go. You know what I'm saying? Because I got people to pick up. Okay. And so uh, I left. I guess she, <laughs> my mother told my sister, I dropped her off at a bus stop, saw her at a bus stop. You got to catch this now. She said, I saw her at a bus stop. And I turned around and rolled by. It was a puddle of water. And I rolled in the puddle of water so the water splashed on her. I was like, man, come on, man. My sister, I was like, you really believe that, though, man? They, we laugh about it now. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's so crazy. But, you know, that's the only incident when me and my sister fell out. But now she's a... She's a pastor as well. She, she's a pastor. Um, um, I believe God called her to be a pastor as well. But she's pastoring in Maryland and I'm pastoring. And she's actually, her and her husband, uh, actually, uh, Barry, was the first one to actually license me as a minister and ordain me because of uh, it was in me, they saw it. But that bitch said I go back to the kid. Like I said, I really don't have much ministry, uh, much ministry. I used to steal cars and stuff. I remember the first time I stole the car. Um, I stole my neighbor's car. <laughs> I wanted to go somewhere. But it's the truth, but it's just so crazy, man, because I got away with it. Just stole another car, got a car. Got a, I was so crazy. I stole the car, parked it in my mama's backyard. My mama like, who car that is right there? Nigga, if you don't get that car, I'm finna call the police. Right. And so, uh, that'll bring me back to when she used to always tell me she was gonna beat me. So one time, my mom told me she was gonna whoop me. And I ran away. And when I ran away, I went and broke into a church. I broke into a church, Zion Hope Baptist Church. Uh, the church my mom, my mom's mother, was a member of that raise us up and everything. And I broke in, into the church, man, and <clears throat> I went to sleep on the bench. And it was so peaceful. And I think God really began to start dealing with me way back then. Um, it's just something was always different about me. You know, I think I, I knew I was called to be a leader, but I, I was always a follower. You know what I'm saying? And then when God took me to prison, he began to show me that, hey, you a leader, you know, because going to school, I went to Rebo. Uh, I went to Rebo, Ocean Way, Rufus E. Payne, Brookview Elementary, uh, what that school is over there on, on 45th and Cleveland Road. I think it might be Simon Johnson. Uh, so I went to those schools. Um, I always, I remember, I remember I was in talent shows, used to dance, crazy, can't dance at all right now. Used to rap, I, I still try to rhyme, I can't rap, you know, I just say stuff to sound like. Um, I was always an active kid, man, but I, again, I was always a fighter. And I was a leader with no direction. I actually started writing, writing a book called uh, Adam, Where Out Thou? I gave it to a good friend of mine, Jack. Jack, I hope you listen to this. I need my stuff. Um, but it's talking about knowing you're a leader, knowing God equipped you or something, but when you're not properly trained to lead people, you will hurt people more than you will help them. And God gave me the sermon um, just this year talking about that a monkey with a machine gun. Because if you put power in the wrong hands, he's gonna hurt everybody, even himself. And so I've been learning just how to be a good leader. And so I just think a lot of stuff as far as my childhood, I do that I have a lot of good memory. I probably do, but there's nothing that really sticks out. You know what I'm saying? Because I was always getting in trouble. And um, after I went to prison, you know, we started learning different type stuff. So. I mean, it does, again, it's, it's kind of sad, but how many other people my age, 49, that really is disconnected from their childhood? You know what I'm saying? And can't even 
uh, talk about a lot of things. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember I used to like one of my teachers, uh, Miss Janikowski. <laughs> I was a rude white lady. Yeah. Yeah. I was a kid, but other than that, I don't have. I did school. I remember music class, Mr. Thompson. I used to play the clarinet. Okay. Uh, I used to try to play, but I always got in trouble with my cousin Keith. Uh, that's my main man. He actually uh, getting ready to come home. Both of us called the life scenes together. Uh, he literally served 30 years, 30 plus, well, I served 21 and I've been out, so 31 years. In that same incident? Yeah, he, he, he's about to get out now, he go to court in November. So God has given him a little grace, God is allowing him to come home after 30 years. I did 21 and I've been out now, I'm on my tip here being out. And so God has done so many amazing things in 10 years, you know, I can only imagine how I lined up with the will of God early on where I would be. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it led you out to uh, get into drugs. Well, I remember I told you, I started selling drugs because I got done pregnant. When she got pregnant, I wanted to be able to provide for my kid. My father uh, wasn't there. I didn't meet my, my biological dad until I was 37 years old, getting ready to get out of prison. And so um, I had called a license, uh, true story, my mom brought a guy named Charles Ford. I just got a life sentence, just was sentenced to life. And she brought a guy named Charles Ford, and they called me and said, uh, Jordan, you got a visit. So I go up there to the visit room in the county jail and I'm getting ready to go to Florida Penitentiary. And, um, my mom's up there with a guy. And so, she up there with a guy. I'm just gonna show you how powerful, if we really believe what we're saying, I'm gonna show you how powerful the words are that come out of our mouth. And so, I get in there, my mom, she happy to see me. I'm like, what's up, mom? So I see dude standing by there. I'm like, who that is? And she, she, she like, that's your dad. I said, huh? She said, that's your dad. I said, that nigga ain't my daddy. I said, man, you, you, you come back and see me, you know, by yourself. I don't want to see that nigga. He ain't my dad. He ain't been on he, I'm getting a life sentence. Now you want to come and say, hey, son. Nah, nigga, you ain't my dad. My mama, my daddy. That's who raised me all my life. Boy, and God bless his soul, uh, Preston Davis, he dead. Um, he died while I was in prison. I'm like, that, that, that ain't my dad. Y'all go, I, I, I walked up out of the room, you know what I'm saying? I know my mom probably was upset, but I was speaking the truth, and they ain't even know. And so, while I was in there, you know, he sent me a picture, he wrote me a, hey man, go get a picture of your sister, I want you to meet your sister and all this stuff here. And my cousin Kenneth, he, he, he did now, he was a preacher as well. Kid up like, man, I work with Charles, Mr. Charles, man, Mr. Charles, good people, man. Uh, your mama say, you know, that's your dad, I like cub, because he used to come see me and minister to me. Man, that ain't my daddy. You know what I'm saying? I really did not know that <laughs> my daddy. Wow. But then I began, to, once he saw me the picture of his daughter, I began to pray, God, you know, I want to have a relationship with my sister. You know what I'm saying? I want to, you know, I want to know my family. And so, Somehow, Mr. Charles faded away, and then, uh, I'm trying to remember what year, or it could have been, I got out in 20, so it probably been 2010. Um, my mom, she called me, and uh, she go again crying, I don't know what she but well, I called her. She said, um, I lied to you, I want to make things right. I'm like, mom, what you talking about, man? Yeah, I said, man, you my mama, man, you can't do no wrong. Like literally, that's what I told you, you can't do no wrong. I've been going through this thing, this thing, you being here supporting me, coming all, driving all over the state, you know, just to come visit me, sending me money, you can't do no wrong. She said, I told you, you remember the guy wrong and I told you that was your daddy? Um, Mr. Charles, I said, Mr. Charles, she said, yeah. She said, well, that's not your daddy. I said, I ain't mad, Ma. I knew that wasn't my daddy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't know it. Uh, I said, man, I ain't mad. I, I know what you were trying to do, you know. She said, but 
I want you to meet your real dad. I said, man, we ain't finna go through that, man. It's all good, man. The horse said, no, I want you to meet your dad. And she uh, gave me her phone number and said, just the number. Called and talked to her. And so immediately when I called, my sister took Kanye and answered the phone. I said, uh, hello? Uh, can I speak to Tommy? She said, uh, who is this? I said, my name is Thomas, uh, that's my daddy. And she was just like, said, oh, this is my brother. My grandma told me about you a long time ago. So automatically, me and her connected, you know what I'm saying? And it's been a blessing. And so when I called him, we finally talking. He was like, man, I looked all over for you. I was like, man, you couldn't have been looking too hard. I'm in the Florida prison system. <laughs> Talk about I even checked the police report. I don't know what police report you checked, because it is. But, you know, we we begin to talk, man, and we begin to, you know, he gave me the opportunity. I said, listen, God gave me the wisdom. I said, can I write you a letter? He said, yes, son, you can write me a letter. And I told him how I felt. I told him about all my disappointments. I told him about how I used to always be looking. My sister and my brothers, they knew they dad. I used to have to always watch when they dad come get them. My dad never showed up, you know what I'm saying? And so I was able to pull all that out. And once I pulled all that out, I got to the point where I was ready to have a relationship with my dad. And it got off good. It, it, it's been real, real good. We talk almost every week. Um, he's in um, Albany, Georgia right now. That's where he lives. And then when I talked to my brother, my brother Thomas, all of us named Thomas, um, I reached out to him. And uh, he's like, nigga, what kind of nigga called a grown man his daddy? I'm like, bro, you mad? Why you mad? I should be the one that's mad. You had him in your life. I ain't had what you mad at me for. But nevertheless, we got past it, you know what I'm saying? He cussed me out, I kind of cussed him back out, you know what I'm saying? Politely, <laughs> you know? You know, just being honest. Um, but, you know, the young lady he's with now, she told me, you know, it ain't now one of y'all fault. That's your brother, you should be trying to make a relationship. So we got together, man. We went, spent a couple of days in uh, uh, Daytona, Orange County. You know, I would be renting them houses and stuff. And, uh, 4th of July, uh, 2020 it was. I mean, we, we connected. So, man, we don't talk as much as me and Takanya, my dad, but we're in a good place. We actually um, scheduled to go together to get together for Christmas uh, in Mississippi so I could meet my auntie uh, this year. So, but, you know, with, with them, we, we getting to know each other. My sister, she know, all us, we love horses and stuff. We, we, we pretty good. Um, Trying to think, my dad is an awesome guy. Um, Thomas Smith, he was in the Marines. Um, been a good guy. He's, he's, he came, he comes to, you know what I'm saying? He come visit me. We talk. I gotta really go see him. So um, that's pretty much my dad inside. I'm trying to see how we got here. Uh, how you how you got to sell drugs? Yeah, so I got I got done pregnant, and um, I have a cousin named Glenn. He was a hustler, and um, I told Glenn, I'm like, man, my dad ain't never been there. That's how we got here. My dad ain't never been there for me, and so I don't want to not be there for my kid. But I wasn't thinking, man, go get a job. You know what I'm saying? I need to make money right now. Ain't nobody. I was really thinking out because I was 15 when Don got pregnant. See, that goes back to. When the girl said to you, having me doing so, see, that's the type of stuff we awakening kids before their time, you know what I'm saying? So, um, he was like, man, listen, I'm gonna give you this, it's so crazy. So, I used to break in houses, me and his brother. And uh, I broke in this one house, and I had so many guns, man. And I was like, man, I'm gonna give you these guns, give me some drugs, I'm gonna go sell the drugs. So he took the gun, he didn't want to do something, he wanted to bring the gun back. Nah, man. 
You don't want that back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, man, you gonna give me my drug. Man, I'm not giving you nothing. And uh, this true story, man, real talk, man. So <laughs> I'm like, I turned my back on a man. Yeah, I'm not giving you nothing. He done choked me out and went in my pocket. Like, literally choked me out. I came. He was like, okay, I got you. I got you. Come on, follow me home. I got the rest of it at the house. <laughs> I was trying to get to a gun. I guess when he got halfway there, he figured that. You know, I came out, he was gone. He was like, man. But that's how I started selling drugs, trying to be a responsible parent. As, as corny as it sounds, it's the truth. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, crazy as it is, Don ended up having a miscarriage. The stories behind that, I won't go into. <laughs> you know, her mom, you know, we, we, we just leave that alone. But it is what it is. So I started selling drugs to try to like take care. But when the kid wasn't born, nowhere in my mind said, hey, you don't have to do this with me. You know what I'm saying? And more than likely with most of us, once we start down the path, we don't realize that, hey, you can change your mind. At any given time, it's okay. Once you realize that this ain't the right thing to do, it's okay to change your mind and try to go and do what's right. And so, I just kept selling drugs and it just kept me, you know, in, in a life of crime, so, pretty much. Um, that's how I started selling drugs. And then I went from dealing with my cousin to dealing with Jamaicans. You know, they get to get you everything. You what you want? Buy, I got you, buy. You know how it is. <laughs> so, whether we, man, whether we were cool, whether we would give me pounds of refund and, and sacks of cocaine that, you know, I would sell and make money. And then one day a guy was like, bro, you making all this money for them. They giving you three, four thousand dollars at the end of the week. And you don't sold tens of thousand dollars worth of dope every day all week. And you think that's good. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you right. So the next time I got the last bomb, I just left with it. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. Never thought it turned bite. I always had to keep, keep a pistol with me because one time with it, I'm at the bus stop. Me and my same cousin, we arguing. <laughs> it's crazy. We arguing. So I'm at his mom house. We was off uh, Cleveland Road and Martin Creek. At the time, it was called. Uh, Mon Creek Village, I believe it was. You know, <clears throat> we argued. So I said, man, you know what, man, I ain't finna argue with you, man. I'm, I'm gonna go jump on the bus. I'm going over here on my side of town. And I'm sitting at the bus stop. Willie Reed done pulled up on me with a little steak knife. I'm trying to cut my throat. Boy, I'm a kid, you boy, with my money, man. I'm like, man, I got you, man. I tell him something to get him up off me, you know what I'm saying? I ain't got no pills or nothing. But, once I got on the bus, like, well, he was like, man, I forgive you, man. I give you a new package. Let's start over. I said, I'm going to call you. Got on the bus. I said, I'm going to call you. But that's how it is, man. I ended up selling drugs. And then, you know, uh, came home and Keith, like I said, we went to the carnival. They had no Keith and Corey. had no Corey gave the carnival workers drugs. You know how you're from. And at the end of the night, after they don't have this show, they pay you and everything. Everything didn't work out <clears throat> the way it's supposed to, so they called me, like I told you from the beginning, man, well, mine, I go get mine. And so that led me to a life sentence. And so I got saved, called my mom, I told her about the kid. We went over that, so is that anything? It's just, you just have to push the right buttons to get whatever you, you need to pull out, you know, uh, that'll be effective, that can help somebody. Uh, because like even when, okay, from serving life to serving life, which is uh, a book I wrote, I wrote about, it's supposed to be about me catching a life sentence and then coming back. And if you believe in what the Bible tells you about Jesus Christ, he's life. And so I'm serving life um, willingly versus being made to serve life. So you kind of get what I'm saying about the book. And it goes on to tell you about how, you know, being mad and, and being without my father, 
become angry and not know how to express that anger. You'd be mad at everybody. And, and, and so, and the devil uses that to, to, to take you further and further away from God. He feeds off uh, your emotions and your insecurities and he uses that to push you and drive you and motivate you further and further away from the truth. And so, uh, I end up writing that book and half of that had to do with just like I was telling with my dad, I'm looking for you to come, you ain't never there. You know what I'm saying? And so now it's something hidden on the inside that, you know, you never know until you get it from God. So once it started coming out, and I started learning more about God, I started trying to figure out how I can help people the most and how I can encourage people. And so it's 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 been it's been um uh, a good life as far as you know how you know that. How you think it's been a good life? I'm still alive. When I used to sell drugs, I'll tell you about this robbery, selling drugs. Um, dude uh, named Eddie, Eddie is dead now. Eddie uh, gave me some drugs one time. And so, no, he didn't. I gave one of Eddie's brother some drugs to sell for me. It was Eddie and Fast Eddie. Fast Eddie was, was his brother, but he smoked dope. So he ran off with my package. And so one day I saw him, me and Keith. Um, you'll hear a lot about Keith because I've done a lot of stuff with Keith. Um, me and Keith, and uh, we ran down on him. So in the process of running down, we got our broad dinner, we got our pussy broad and everything. Where my money at? You know what I'm saying? And so uh, Eddie come out the liquor store at the time. It was on uh, Murrow, it's, it's Mon Creek, right there by um, Golfield. If you know where Golfield and Mon Creek is, it's a pipeline now. It's a gas station it's called Pipeline. But it used to be an ABC Jack's liquor. And um, Eddie was coming out of there. And um, he's like, Lil T, man, what you doing, man? Lil TJ, man, why you got your piss on my brother? I nigga ran off with my pack, with my package, man. I want my money. So Keith was like, man, who this nigga? I said, this is your brother, man. He's like, man, we shoot this nigga too. I said, nah, man, man, got this old lady in the car. And the kid, man, man you tripping, cuz. Mm. So um, Eddie said, man, I'm gonna pay you, I'm gonna pay you, man. So, uh, the big brother, Eddie, he like, man, no, man, I'm gonna give you this, that's called a square. I said, okay. So my cousin like, man, who should have did it? And then I said, man, listen, I know what he said. I went to Eddie's house, it's a true story. Went to his house, my on the door. He gonna open the door, cause it's me. You know what I'm saying? So, um, this this is nothing but God has always had me covered. And, and when God has you, you don't know the danger that he can keep you from. So I get the dude to open the door. Once he knew it was me, he had a, he had a Mike 10. You had Mike 11s and Mike 10. The Mike 10 shoot 45 bullet shells. And when he saw it was me, when you come in the door, he said, on the door. But once I came through the door, everybody bust in before me. And he saw him and ran up the stairs. When he saw him, I, you know, when he ran, I looked down and seen the gun. I grabbed the gun. They going upstairs. They trying to, I'm like, no, I'm dope in the kitchen. Let's go get the dope. Let's get up out of here. <laughs> and so um, they debating on going upstairs. I'm like, no, nah, man, the man, people upstairs. I ain't come here for that. You know what I'm saying? And so, but I study here. <laughs> you got another one up there. You know what I'm saying? So everybody running out. I'm the last person coming out. He upstairs, hanging out the window, man. He got his gun like this here pulling the trigger, and the trigger won't shoot. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you today as humbly as we know how. Uh, no ego, we don't have any hidden uh, motives, uh, nothing on our heart that is against our brothers or our sisters out there. 
We ask you for forgiveness of our sin. We pray and ask you that you um, shed some light on the story and that, that you make it applicable to people who who's in a transition, that they may uh, uh, make that transition in your name. Um, we pray that uh, a lot of people are touched and that they share the story. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, you ready? Ready, roll? Fine. Uh, yeah, you roll. Oh, you roll hard. Right. Right. <laughs> Pastor Thomas, um, I met you, uh, I think it was September 2020. Um, when I first saw your face, you was, you was riding with uh, someone. You know, man, you look familiar. Uh, still today, don't know <laughs> where I seen you from. You, just, you know, just I don't know if it's just the spirit or whatever. But uh, you just uh, look very familiar to me. Um, upon starting the job with the uh, Care Violence Global thing, uh, uh, there's some things going on. And you you came to me. You were like, hey man, listen. However you want to do it, I'm rock with you. Um, you gave me the rundown of how things work. Um, you was open to receive um, new direction, um, regardless of, of how things came about. You were still willing. You were still um, able to make yourself pliable to uh, new circumstances. So uh, that says a lot about you, about your character, and about um, where you come from. You know, that, that caused that trans for you to make that easy of a transition. So what are some of the events um, in life that help you make that transition? When uh, normally uh, without going through something that that transition normally don't be is that easy. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's, 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 they be like, hold on, man, I ain't been done right in the first place. So. And then on top of that, you insult me by bringing somebody else in to and do the job that I was right, <laughs> right. And then you got to train them, so it, uh, we'll replace you, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there's some God somewhere. It's, it's what happens is for me, you know, transition because you in prison, you really have to learn how to adapt. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A lot of stuff that go on in prison, you don't have a say. Mm -hmm. No matter how you feel or what you think about the situation, you know, you either, you know, they got a sense say you either roll with the punches or get rolled over, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the best boxers, even with Mayweather, some of his best one fights is because he know how to roll with the punches. And anyway, taking a lot of force from the blow. Right. So it's not really as hard as it would be. Mm -hmm. So I think what I know, uh, coming from prison, dealing with, different it's things were subject to change every day and then your attitude get to the point that um, if it's about right you know transitioning from you know we're saying okay transfer of power mm -hmm. you have to understand that even in the church that's our job is to raise folks up to do what God called them to do right you know God didn't call us to be you no know, Lord over the people and so you, the thing is you have to learn how to train people to do it right that speaks a lot about you as a person and your character is that, you know, some people are like, man, I ain't gonna show them everything or bump mm -hmm. this here. No, I think when you, you do yourself a disservice, if, you know, you test with the uh, job of, of, of helping somebody to be their greatest mm -hmm. and you shortchange them. Right, right. Or you, you, you restrain them or put a muzzle them. You don't train them to be the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. That, that, that speaks a, a lot about your character mm -hmm. as a person, like envious, bitterness, that type of stuff I don't want associated with me. Right, right. And I just believe that if we're on the same team, if you win, I win. And then if I do the right thing, always God see me. Mm -hmm. And then God is my final judge. God will say, okay, well, you handled that situation real good so I can trust you in this situation. And I think that's what the Bible tells us that, um, uh, he says that, how you handle another man's good, you know, mm -hmm. or dictate how you get your own. 
And so I think if we treat each other the way God called us to treat each other, it ain't got nothing to do with the job. It's just who I am. I don't have to like something. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. To do what's right. The Bible says David and everything always behave wisely. Mm -hmm. Even Jonathan, you know, he had a right. You know, when we look at the Bible aspect, he had a right to have an issue with David. Mm -hmm. He was the oldest son, so he was the next in line to be the king. Right. But he respected Mm -hmm. who God put in place, mm -hmm. who God anointed. And that's the same way, okay, if this is who it's gonna be, then I'm gonna do my part and help regardless of what it is. Mm -hmm. if, if a lot of us take that attitude, then we wouldn't be in the place that we're in today as far as, as a people, you know what I'm saying? Right, as right. Like people like, it, it's his turn today. Right. If I if I help him run right, maybe it's just a lot of biblical characters that I could use. That, mm -hmm. that even when Jonathan, uh, when he was in the prison, wasn't it Jonathan? He was in, not Jonathan. Uh, Jacob, Jacob's son that went to prison. Joseph. Joseph. When Joseph went to the prison, he did right by people. He wasn't bitter and said, "Oh, well, I ain't did that." The punches. But if I do right, mm -hmm. right where I'm at, God will bring me up at the right time. You see that in. in that's a powerful statement because, like you said, we can go all throughout the Bible, uh, Job, uh, Abraham, you know what I mean? Uh, people who has, you know, to have faith in God is simply just to believe what he says, uh, to do what he commanded without question. Those two great examples as well, um, uh, you know, against, you know, you know, it's hard to fight with pillow talk. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe White was constantly in his ear. Yeah. That's his bait. Yeah. But she told him to go against God. He said, uh-uh. No. He got his homeboys. They said, yeah, listen, man. God ain't come by now. He ain't coming. Right. He's going, you know what I'm saying? going to do. No. He held on. Right. Because, you know what I'm saying? It's, we can say that we have believed in God. But when it's time to actually do, when it's crunch time, and, when all this failed and you don't have nothing left, you're like, well, I guess God, no, he, hold on. Yeah. He coming. Same thing with Abraham. You know, kept telling the sons, I'm going to provide. <laughs> well, I mean, God that, that, that shows you two, there's two aspects of, you know, what we're talking about, the faith and the belief. You know right. what I'm saying? You can really have faith in something, but then your faith will let you down. I don't care what nobody tell you. Sometimes you will get weary in your faith, but your belief, is what's gonna push you through. Cause when you really believe God, no matter what the circumstances look like, you it has to come to pass. Right. You and and you saying? have to you have to suffer through it. Abraham was really gonna kill his son. He was gonna do it. He really believed <laughs> God just yeah. that much. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because right. faith can only get you so far. Right. You know, you can right. only believe so far. What about the stuff that you can't see? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can only what, what, hope, let me put it that way. But that, was, but that was the Bible saying, you know, faith uh, is the substance right. of the things that are hopeful. The evidence, the evidence right. of things that are not seen. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's that, God said, faith is the only thing that moves God. That's it. You know what I mean? And, and you can't have, you can't live in this world today and say you believe in God. Right. But then your life dictate something else. It, 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 so then here we go, we, here we go again when we're changing the norm. It's the kind of productive. Right. You know so you say, like, yeah, I believe, I believe uh, uh, you go to jail and you smoke this weed and drive. Right. <sighs> Why are you smoking and drive? It's like, no, nah, you can't believe that much because you, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> you can't believe. So it's like, like you say, it, they, they, faith and belief, they run hand in hand. Right. You can't split them two and be like, yeah, I, I believe God, but I don't have faith in him. That is dumb. I mean, you can't well, be, you can't have faith. And that's how some people are, even with the word of God. I believe God, but then uh, I still should be able to know you no. want to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then you just saying, um, God is good enough to be God, but his word ain't good enough to dictate my life. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So I can well, acknowledge I God, a God. But, I don't but how can you acknowledge him and you don't walk in obedience with right. his word? I really believe that a lot of people get so much religious stuff confused or mixed up with relationship because God knows well, without a, lot, a doubt we're gonna fail that a lot, of, a lot of people believe in the police, mm -hmm. but we don't have no faith in it. They ain't got faith in it. No, see, and that's another thing, just like you're saying, 
I know that the police exist. Right. But I have a situation. I don't got faith enough that the police can handle this situation or keep me safe in it. Or, or yeah, that was say. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah, right. So, so like, just because you know something and believe something, don't mean that your faith. Your, your faith is in, is keeping your faith. Your faith um, is the glue that yeah. tie things together. So, uh, with that being said, um, your transition from prison and you. You say you did about twenty two years? Twenty one years. Twenty one years. Twenty one years stint. That's a that's a that's a lifetime. Especially yeah. for these young jicks I had don't even really live to see twenty one. Right. You know what I mean? And so that mental embodiment of, uh, of guilt, right? At, at some point we hold ourselves accountable for things that we do, didn't do, should have done, would have done, could have done. And let's talk about the moment that you was released from that. You know what I mean? Uh, the moment when they say, hey man, be free to go. Uh, and what, what, what impact did that have on you mentally? And as far as your transition with God, you know, because sometimes people uh, believe in God and He get them through, and then whoop, appreciate you. Then they go and do their yeah, own thing. I mean, it's funny. I don't know if I talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, and I, I probably did. I, I remember when I was first released. You know what I'm saying? And as I think about it now, it's like, and that was a point where I questioned what I was going to do, how I was going to handle it. You know, you've been locked up for 21 years, people telling you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, and one of the things that, that I would like to eat first to be able to advocate and, and stand in, in the gap for is those guys that are getting out behind me. Because when I got out, I didn't have no resource. They had stuff in place, mm -hmm. you know, t Rick and all those, and they had that stuff in place. But it's not really designed to really help you, mm. you know what I'm saying? It's mm. just a way to funnel money, gotcha. or the way to say, oh, we're helping these guys. But it can't be that good because the recidivism rate is still high, mm. especially for those that come through mm. the system that they're supposed to have they're in place, have you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. But for me, it was, um, I just knew I didn't want to go back. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to go back. But that ain't enough to keep you from going back. You know, a lot of right, people right. don't want to go back. back. But then, it's the right circumstances, they put uh -huh. you back in there. Like I said, I got out. I was, I was overwhelmed. I was telling her, my auntie. She just passed last week. Um, she threw a party for me, so we was, um, we was talking to everybody. Like, man, come on, we're gonna take you to the club. We're gonna do all that. And I'm like, you know, and, and now I was, you know, a preacher. Like, man, I can't go to no club and all this stuff. But later that night, one of my brothers um, that I was staying with, he talked me into going mm -hmm. to the club with him. So when I get there, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I probably said it earlier, but he was uh, he was a photographer in the club and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get up and I'm sitting right there, and then two girls come sit. It's so dark in this place. It's called the Real Team, so you probably know about it. The real team cafe at that time. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. No, no. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm in this place, man. And two girls come sit by me, and they start doing what they do mm -hmm. in public. And I just swear to God, I'm looking at demons. And I ran out of that crime, and I was telling my brother, he come out, I'm like, man, what's wrong? I said, bro, I can't, I can't be in this place, man. I gotta be out here to preach and, and say a lot. I can't be in this place. And I was crying. But then six months later, I found myself right back in there, mm -hmm. wide open, drinking, and hanging out. But you know, it got to a point that I got into an issue and then I had some fights with my brother. And I know I said this earlier, I had got into some scuffle with my brother and I had a puncture lung or puncture lung mm -hmm. or something. I think it was that puncture lung. And that's when God told me, I didn't bring you out for this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then after that, man, it's just been God ever since, you know. Mm -hmm. When I went to prison, I wasn't a drinker. I don't know how he ended up drinking, but ended up drinking and hanging out. But then, like I said, I got a nap with my brothers. I had to go to the hospital. 
Um, I could have died. It wasn't that I knew I could have died, but if I wouldn't have went, like mm -hmm. I could have, I had to hold him alone. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And so, uh, but when I was in the hospital, God said, I need to bring you out of this. Mm -hmm. And so I got to the place where I was like, okay, let me get this together. And uh, I'm just gonna live it. I gotta live it right now. I just been living. That ain't mean that I ain't had struggle. That ain't mean that I ain't fall because we're still in the flesh. That's gonna happen. I don't care how spiritual deep mm -hmm. they try to tell you. Absolutely. They are and they the Bishop Tutu or the Pope and all and all. Everybody in this flesh got it. Right. As long as they dealing with this monkey suit. So but it was it was really my faith in God to just believe that when I, I think what really helped me to do everything that I do now is that I look back when I had that life sentence and God took it off me. Mm -hmm. And um they tried to give it back and God said, What I say shaped the universe. You know, literally that's what I heard God say to me. So what I say shaped the universe, what man said means something to man. Mm -hmm. And so when I came home and God they sent me back and um uh, Said that the judge is wrong. I was like, God, this is, this ain't right. This is cruel. And God said what He said, and I came home. Ever since then, I just believe whatever God say, it's gonna mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He put it in my spirit, even with this building right now. You know, once it was in my spirit, it's it manifested what you can see. Like this is ours. You know what I'm saying? So when you believe God, it only take God to prove me one time mm -hmm. that anything else that I deal with, He would He'll do. Anything I bring to him, he put it in my spirit and says, it's yours. The Bible says no good thing with it withhold from them that walk upright. As long as it's good, mm -hmm. see, upright might be something different to you than mm -hmm. it is to me. Mm -hmm. But God have a standard. As long as I'm walking upright in the word of God, trying to apply it to my life, I'm in good standing. Mm -hmm. I ain't say I don't see him. Mm -hmm. I ain't say I'm perfect in spirit, but not in flesh. Mm -hmm. And if we learn how to differentiate, you know, between the two then we can go further with what we're trying to do. When I know in the spirit, I'm trying my best, because the Bible says, you know, the spirit walk with the flesh. Right. Whatever one you feed daily, that's what's going to win. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have days where lust ain't going to beat you. You're going to have days where right. alcohol ain't going to beat you, because uh -huh. you're going to be feeding your spirit. Right. But what about that day when you, you know, can nobody say they don't take a day off. Right. Everybody, Everybody take a day off. off. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Off. And that time you take a day off, you might be strong today, but you might not be strong tomorrow. That's why the Bible said we die daily. You got to. Right. Um, and, uh, another, I always say that, you know, what you feed grows, what you starve die. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are practicing the fruits of the Spirit, if you are practicing, you know, uh, reading your Bible, praying and meditating, the Bible said, let the mind of Christ also be in you. Mm -hmm. So that, you know what I'm saying, when, you, when God sanctifies you, it means to set you apart from everything else, then he would keep, you know what I'm saying, a mm -hmm. uh, 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 mind that stayed on Jesus. So he would keep you in perfect peace, you know what I mean? So he, he keeps you, but it's, the, it's that day off. Like you said, when you take a day off, you really look around and see what you really, <laughs> what well, he's see, really keeping you from. But that's the, the good part about it, it, Joe, it's like real talk, you know, when I realize it's not me that's keeping me, oh, yeah. I do better. Yeah. Just like I, I, I had an opportunity to preach last night. When they really expect to preach, but I said to the people, uh, I said, man, if you think about Jesus, this ought to make you consider the people that you hang around. The Bible said that Jesus was always with sinners. Mm -hmm. Oh, whatever you find, you want to find Jesus, go find some sinners. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I said, but now once we get saved, we don't run with the sinners no more. Mm -hmm. We all judgmental. You know what I'm saying? I don't need nobody around me that ain't got no sin in their life. They looking at me crazy. No, but for real, because God not working on you. Mm -hmm. You don't got God present in your life, but if you got an issue, God is working on you. Mm -hmm. That'll make you be compassionate about the people that you're with, because the Bible says Jesus always had compassion.